Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Before I start tonight's podcast, there's uh, something important I'd like to discuss. Sadly, it's come to my attention that a number of people, not known to me, are going around the country sharing the areas of the sighting reports on their own channels and passing off my cases as their own. I have sadly had to make my map and my case files private until further notice. The last thing I need is a complete stranger bungling in to an active investigation or intruding on a witness's private home or the places that they visit. In one incident that's come to my attention recently, a well-known investigation team here in the northwest of England surveilled a witness to and from their home and to the moor and back on several occasions. I offer full confidentiality, and these acts are the opposite of what I feel is acceptable. So on that note, Let's get back to business as usual and look at one of our cases here at BBR. Tonight, I'd like to share with you some of the personal experiences that have happened to one of our BBR members and a friend of mine. I met Keith several years ago now and he's shared some amazing events and also his theories and opinions on many of the cases that I've worked on. So being able to share the events that have happened to him since early childhood is a task I don't take lightly. I promise Keith I'll keep the name of the village and the area that this happened in private for now. Like many of you out there listening, Keith's experiences started at a very young age. The first account he shared with me happened many years ago when he was a very young man. He was saved from falling over a cliff edge by a creature who returned him to safety. I'd like to share that account with you first. And then we'll take you on a journey through Keith's many paranormal, supernatural and otherworldly occurrences. I have some very similar experiences, Deb, to the people you interview. And I've had some strange interactions growing up and as an adult. So I know what it's like to have things happen over and over and what the confusion and questions are like that you're left with. The first event I'd like to share happened when I was a very young child. At the time, I was playing in the field behind my parents' house, which is close to the coast in the northeast of Scotland. I was around the age of four, maybe five. It would have been in the 1970s, I think 72, 73, something like that. I do remember that it was summertime and the weather was nice. Being little, I didn't understand why this happened, but I remember running to the edge of the field that faced out towards the coastal cliff. And at first, everything was fine. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, I had the feeling I was somehow somewhere else entirely. I distinctly remember the fear that something was chasing me and that I had to escape it. I was so scared, I ran straight off the cliff. I was hanging from the edge and it was a dangerous place to be. The drop alone would be fatal if I fell. And I had to hold on to what I could grab with every bit of the strength that I had. By this point, I was screaming as I could feel that the grass was wet and I was slowly slipping. I can still remember how panicked and scared I was. I was hoping one of the other adults or a kid would hear me and come running. And then, from nowhere, a large hairy hand, complete with an airy arm, came over the lip, grabbed me tightly and pulled me back. It lifts me up, carries me back to the safe part of the cliff. I can't tell you what this thing carrying me was. I vaguely remember holding onto its head. I remember that its ear was pointer and hairy, and it spoke to me and it said, you go that way, and pointed to where I could see my brother and his friend walking along. They were out looking for me. All the time the creature stayed with me to make sure I was going in the right direction. I looked at it one last time and I looked away and then back again and it was gone. It completely vanished. When my brother and his friend got close to me and asked where I'd been, I said I was with that dogger. We weren't taken out on the moor until we were at least seven or eight and we never went there without an adult. It's pretty dangerous in places. There's a lot of dunes and thick bogs. As an adult, I know the moor like the back of my hand. It's familiar to me now. Though it is an odd place, there are spots of odd energies. 
the old villagers used to say, don't go in the moor at night and stay out of the caves. We were urged to stay away from the middle of the moor. My friend ignored this advice. On a dare, he went to the middle of the moor and he felt nothing, he said. But on his way back, he could tell something was following behind him, stalking him as he walked home. He looked, but he couldn't see anything. He described the feeling as just total fear. He ran until he reached the old cottages. And at the first set of street lights, he stopped to get his breath back. And as my friend stood there panting, he heard footfall. He heard them coming towards him, but he couldn't see what was making the noise. All in all, that night, he ran at full pelt for two miles. Many years later, I was leaving school at the end of summer, in 1983. We had a beach party with all of our friends to celebrate. I remember it was a still summer's night and the sea was calm. We were all sitting at the end of the pier, talking, when I heard one of my friends cry out to us. We all got up and went looking for him. And as I'm searching, I see what I think is him, crouching by the old house on the cliff. So thinking it'd be funny to scare him, I broke away from the rest of our friends and decided to sneak up on him. I crept up slowly, making no sound, and I pounced. That was a huge mistake. It was not my friend at all. The thing that I'd startled stood up and it looked directly at me. It was as shocked to see me as I was to see it. It's hard to describe what it looked like, but the best description I can give is that it looked like a solid shadow. It had long arms, long legs, a long body and a small head. It was approximately seven or eight feet tall standing upright. Then it turned and shot off at speed down the path to the sea. The closest I have ever got to seeing something in real life to show the description of the thing I saw was when I was watching the movie Sign. Not a great film, but correct as a comparison to what it looked like. It was approximately seven feet plus in height and five nine. The body on it was slender. It looked like a solid shadow. Around me there was this tingling, metallic buzzing sensation. I couldn't move. It tasted metal-like. It turned and ran like the wind, down into the dark path of the quarry, and it seemed to fall forwards, running on all four of its legs. And as it pulled away from me, I started speaking, almost as I'd clicked back into that moment. And I don't know why, but I ran after it, shouting my friend's name. I followed it into the dark. But once I was alone in the darkness, I was filled with absolute terror. I spun around and ran back up the dark pathway as fast as I could. Then I ran down a flight of steps and across the road. I'm running back up the path, heading for streetlights. I'm flying. I was terrified. And something was behind me. And for the second time in my life, I feel the same terror of being caught. Everyone has gone and there's no one in the lower town. And this thing runs down the steps and jumps them. And it moves across the road to the old steps leading up to the shop. Almost as it reached the correct distance, it spoke in my mind. It said, you're safe. And at the time, I didn't really even realise that. I was thinking to myself, why did I run? My sister said for many nights after this, I would wake up screaming. All my friends were at the top of the village and I was somewhere else in Tyler. And I'd lost about 15, 25 minutes in time. As you can imagine, lots of nightmares followed this experience. I also have an irrational fear of werewolves. I've always had it. They terrify me. I've been a keen person to be interested in Bigfoot, dogmen, paranormal UFO events due to the things I've experienced. I've spent my whole life, like you Deb, trying to make sense of it all. And sometimes I'm convinced, whatever these things are, they keep tabs on me. And they keep tabs on other people too. I understand what Keith has had to endure. Some of the events in his life would terrify many an adult, let alone a young man. It's hard enough navigating life and her obstacles as it is. 
throw in some extraordinary events that happen to you often and confusion it's a whole new level. I remember being torn between asking my friends if weird stuff happened to them or keeping my secret, just trying to figure out why me all by myself. Looking back with hindsight, statistics and my experience in this subject tells me I would not have been the only child experiencing paranormal activity from a young age that went to my school. And that's why it's so important we share our experiences as adults if we can. I needed a podcast like this when I was a teen. It would have given me an identity. One other than the mixed up kid nobody ever really liked. Myself and Keith have chatted on and off over years and it was only recently that I asked him if I could share some of the things that have happened to him. As I know there are other folk out there that will identify with the situation he's found himself in and may have experienced something similar themselves. Or for others who've long forgotten about an event when suddenly a new picture, a place, a scent or a smell suddenly remember something lost in the depths of time. That can be even more confusing. I'm often asked how. How could we have forgotten that, Deb? How could we have forgotten something so obscure? The mind is an amazing thing. And that's what happened to Keith when he was online one day and he came across an image carved from a tree. He said, Hi Deb, I came across this post earlier today and I wanted to let you know that it stirred a memory for me. When I was a very young child, I was awoken by something else to where I was sleeping. I was so young, I was still in my crib, which was between my parents' bed, close to the back wall. The only way I can explain it is that things standing there look like a tree, only a dark and shadowy tree, and it scared me and I started to cry. My father started to shout at my mum to wake up, and it moved quickly over to him as if it was drawn by the sound or the energy he was creating. And then my mum picked me up. I don't remember much from back then, but that tree thing I see as clear as day in my mind. The carving that I showed you looks exactly like it, although the head on the thing was more upright, not horizontal. Keith went on to add, it moved as if it was flowing. My father was so shocked, so without realising, he hit out at mum to wake her up and he instantly lost interest in me when this happened. I don't know how young I was, but I do remember that I was in my crib, just at the standing up by yourself stage. It went straight to my dad. Now looking back with hindsight, I would say it moved like an octopus. The whole event was sketched onto my memory. The tree sculpture that he showed me was actually represents the word mother, the creator, in Old Arabic and Swahili culture. Over the years, Keith had mentioned some UFO experiences to me and I asked him to elaborate a little bit and explain more about what happened during those events. And he did, he said, I remember walking to work one morning, probably 2008. I'd leave about 5am, so I was in time for, to catch the bus at 6. It was still dark as I cut over the moor because it was much quicker going that route than going by the road. And as I was nearly at the gate, I saw something move in the sky above me. I stopped and I watched the light for a little while. Then I headed off on my own just to catch the bus. But as I reached the other gate, I was overcome with a sudden migraine headache. It was so intense, I fell over onto my back. And I'm looking up and I saw an almond-shaped object up there above me. And it was no matter longer dark. The whole sky had changed. It was now like a dim violet colour. My whole head was pounding. It was really painful. And the almond shaped object just shot off into the sky and it was gone. The headache stopped as the light left. So I got up on autopilot and went to catch the bus. One of the villagers stopped to give me a lift to town. And he took one look at me and drove me straight back home saying, you're not going to work like that, Keith. On arriving home, I looked in the mirror. My whole body was very pale. My expression did have a look of illness, like I was covering from a bad case of the flu. I took a week off work before I was able to go back. Though this may or may not have anything to do with this event, I feel it does. I think it's there's an incident that seemed to tie into it, Deb. 
A few weeks before I was hit with that headache, the weather forecast was forecasting strange weather anomalies in my area. It was really odd as there was no thunderclouds or any lightning storms. But as I arrived close to the same gate on the moor, myself and some of the other villagers waiting on the bus saw lightning strike repeatedly on the same spot on the moor. We were parallel to the road, around three miles inside the moor at that point. Me and them just walked home. We noticed the same thing was happening out on one of the rocks that sticks out in the sea. I got home, I watched the lightning from my window. Then I went to the headland that overlooks a fishing village to get a view of the rock. And sure enough, the lightning continued to strike at the same spot. Then something nipped the back of my leg. I turned and I saw that it was the farmer's sheepdog. He took at my trousers and then herded me back into the village. Every time I tried to go back to look at the lightning, he blocked me. I got the impression I was being told to go home, so I went. And the dog then walked back to its house, keeping an eye on me the whole time. The lightning continued in the same place, on and off, for most of the night. Another odd thing was there was no rain or thunder. It wasn't weather that was causing the lightning. The tribal folk say that they travel in the lightning. The weather office said it was just high-level atmospheric weather. Camping was a way of life for us. We saw the northern lights many a time. They cast down from true north, multicoloured and beautiful. But the oddest one myself and my friends saw was a large meteorite with a curling twist of smoke and it lit up the horizon and then disappeared over it and we heard a loud bang and a hiss. The following day there was a Royal Navy ship sat out there in the same place and we knew the difference. The other thing we saw was a narrow band of light that was going from west to east. I reckon now it was one of their travel bands, maybe. The next time I spoke with Keith, he asked me if I'd ever had an out-of-body experience and went on to explain that he had. Deb, have you ever had an out-of-body experience prior to seeing the things you saw as a kid? I did, when I was two and a half. It happened before the incident with the thing close to my crib. Keith said, I remember as I passed over, I was in a blue column of light. That light loved me, and I loved it. Ever after, with hindsight, I've seen things, the same things that you see. I think it started them for me. I think that event may have tuned me into their frequency. Or does it make it easier for them to interact with us somehow? I think my first encounters started happening more often between the ages of four and five. He said that was the age that he saw the hairy creature that saved him on the cliff. Mum said that by the time she would got to me I had completely gone and it was the ambulance driver who brought me back to life. I think I've been in these fields of energy quite a few times in my life Deb. They feel cold, a taste, a metallic taste. And there's a tingle sensation with it all. The colour red is important to them somehow. I think they use it to shield themselves. And that's why people report red eye shine. The one you saw, and the one that helped me, had hair. The natives, American tribal folk, say they look after us. And this does seem to be the case for me, Deb. I did understand what Keith meant when he asked me if I'd ever had um, an out-of-body experience or if I'd ever died. Um, I can't think of any, but any of them before my event started. But the day I had my accident in 2006, I died three times. I suffered injuries that would kill most folk. And somehow, I survived it. Even the doctors were shocked. I remember coming to and being so angry that I was back here that I was still alive. I snapped at the nurses in the operating recovery room. I wanted to go back home, not knowing any more where home was. I remember a few events in my life where I watched myself injured and being brought back. My biggest puzzle has always been why? Like Keith, I've had a lifetime of things and beings around me. I used to be really ashamed of it. My first memory was in my cot, so I must have been very young. Mum said I came out of a raging, and I've raged at something invisible 
ever since. I suffer really badly with night terrors as they call them and I've had them my entire life. Before I could walk, I would always be in trouble as I'd tip myself out of my cot. I'd land on my mum's bed and then I'd come out of the room upset because something was in there and it scared me. My parents would pop me back into bed because I'd had a nightmare and as soon as that door shut, the horror just started again for me. One night, lying there, scared to death, someone held my hand and spoke in my mind. And she, because she was a she, had the best feel. She told me how to shrink the things that scared me in my mind and then showed me how to push them away. I learned that lesson later on with another guide. I didn't know her name then, but now I know her as Sarah. We share DNA. I can hardly explain it now as an adult, let alone as a kid. It's even harder trying to explain it to a non-believer. And that's one of the reasons I do what I do now. Talking to other people about this made me realise hundreds of us go through the same things. And as I explained all this to Keith, he understood immediately. When Keith replied, he said, Yeah, I can relate to all of that, Deb. I've heard the breathing you talked about right next to my left ear and there's never anyone there. For years this has happened to me and then a friend came forward and showed me how to ask them to step back and they directed me to the story about a Native American lady. She experienced the same as me and you. The Native American lady's grandmother was called No Eyes and the story had a message for me about self-preservation. You can still get the book, it's called Spirit Song by Summer Rain, and there's a whole series of these books. Practical, in-depth advice, woven together within the autobiography of No Eyes. Keith went on, on another occasion I was down, major depression. I was sitting looking out the window, feeling futile. I said out loud, there's no purpose to this life. And suddenly a force hit me square between my shoulders. And a voice in my mind said, there is a purpose. Knowing filled me from top to bottom as I landed on the other side of the room. Keith went on, I'm a peripheral kind of person, Deb. I've never really gelled with mainstream beliefs. I've spent years now sitting next to other folks' belief systems, warming myself at the campfires and then moving on, taking some of their fire with me as I go, if that makes sense. Even the shadow folk have given up on me now because they don't scare me anymore. All I see of them is a small energy mass moving in through the house from time to time. It's just the way of it. Do you ever get the feeling we're being trained for something, Deb? You know, what is the purpose for the crown chakra? Time to sleep, Deb. Maybe dream walking might help. I have to say it was the same for me. I had lots of hints and nudges throughout life. In fact, I've run and hid from more than just revelations due to not wanting the weight of the responsibility. And that's me being 100% honest. I long for normal. What is it like to go through life knowing where you fit and why you're there and what you are? What's that like? Why do I see, hear and experience what others don't? I have more in common with a 16th century alchemist than I did with many of my peers in life. John Dee would understand my constant search for answers. He too scribed and strived to see the opening into the peripheral world and share it with others. It was his biggest goal. Whilst being persecuted for being a complete crackpot, I own the rights to that feeling. I should have titled my last book, The Girl Who Sees Monsters. Key said, you were 15 when it revealed itself to you, Deb. I saw the Wraith thing when I was 15. I was almost 16. That's the experience at the beach where I lost time. I saw that thing run away from me and that's how I know they can run like the wind. That one was more like an abduction if I'm honest. For the life of me, I don't know why I ran after it. And in doing so, I lost a good 15, 25 minutes in time. That really freaked me out. I wouldn't go near the place at night afterwards in case it happened again. Like you, I don't sleep well. My family say I scream in my sleep, but I have no memory of it waking up. Seeing that thing as a teen is the one incident that made me start studying this stuff. 
back then it wasn't a quick Google search, more a case of getting a library card and then books, 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 books on repeat. I'd read everything, he said, from mythology, religion, spirituality, mathematics, which in itself is an odd one, he said. My brain's dyslexic with numbers, symbols, reverse letters and numbers. I'm useless with all of that. But I can understand mathematics. I can't write it, but I understand it. I used to paint watercolour pictures. I wasn't bad at it. It was a hobby of mine, he said. And then I started to see faces appearing in the paintings. It's almost like an overview of another place in close proximity to our reality. A bit like remote viewing works. Only with me, it's images that tune me in. I stopped painting. It kind of ruined it for me, Deb. Many folk who have abilities struggle with reading, writing, maths and structured learning. I have a condition called Erlen syndrome. It affects how my brain processes learning, especially around language and the written word. I really struggle with it. It has many disadvantages, including sensory overload and fatigue. I had to teach myself how to tune the words in on a page because I see the white rivers that run between the words rather than the words themselves. They're normally a bit blurry. Like wearing your parents' spectacles when you're a kid and then trying to read a book. That's what all written text looks like for me. And I cannot do even the simplest of mathematical problems. But on the flip side, it has its advantages. I remember everything. I remember everything I read. And I can read a map or an area like a topographical expert. Our brains are what I call neurodivergent. We work on the peripheral. We access and process things differently than most folk. Or I should say, most folk think differently than us. I see what ordinary folk see as quirky or weird as an advantage now. I used to be so ashamed of it. Life is a whole spectrum and it takes all sides and shades of that spectrum just to navigate your path. Don't make it harder for yourself as I did. Don't run from it. Don't deny it. Lean into it. Be proud of it. Accept it. And look for answers your own way. Keith said, Many years ago when I was much younger, Deb, I was with Mum and the family and they were watching one of the Apollo rockets launching. And Mum said I was drawing something and not paying attention to the TV at all. And she said, Keith, watch the rocket. And I said to her, no, they're going in the wrong way. I showed her my picture. I'd drawn the rocket coming down from space and then flying into a flower. The whole family laughed. It became just a happy memory that Mum told as I got older. Thinking back on the incident, I realised it was prior to the first encounter with the hairy creature on the cliff. One second I was out the back of the house playing and the next I was being chased by something that made me run off a hundred foot cliff. Where they found me, Deb, that day was four miles away, four miles south of where I should have been. Like you, Deb, I'm just trying to make sense of it all. The Hopi elders say that the increasing appearances of Bigfoot and other creatures are not only a message or warning to the individuals or communities to whom he appears, but also to humankind as a whole. He said, as Matheson put it, they see Bigfoot as a messenger who appears in evil times as a warning from the creator. To the whole pair, the big hairy man is just one of the forms that the messenger can take. I suggested to Keith that he write out a list of any strange experiences he remembered taking place at any point in his life. I often ask witnesses to do this, as it not only enables me to see what kind of activity they're attracting or that they're sensitive to, but it also seems to jog the memory, as the list then tends to become ever longer. It's something I do myself, along with a dream journal. I sometimes get very lucid dreams that seem to convey a very similar message. I'm not as polite as Keith. So I would say the universe is completely done with our shit and she's taking back what's hers. She gifted our forefathers with the health of her being and we pissed on it from a great height. And now we're paying for the decisions of greedy idiots long ago dead. Thankfully, so many of us are now awake and we're trying to awaken so many others. The big push is coming. 
Humanity is hanging by a thread and it's the perfect time to push the scales in our favour. Lead the cash greedy despots to themselves. All they have for protection is money. That can't shield you from the wrath that's on its way. I think Keith is spot on when he says he feels trained. I do too. As if my whole life has been leading to this point. Everything has combined to put me and others where we need to be at this specific time. You're probably feeling it yourself, even if you can't voice it. It's that feeling in your very core that something bad is on its way and not everyone will make it out the other side. He said, Many things happened to me when I was inside and around the cliff. I've been trying to make sense of it all and why in that area? The village at the north end of the cliffs, at the time we called it the Lynx, our village is a picturesque postcard summer holiday village with about 80 houses total. A harbour, a couple of shops, a beach. The village seems to have the feel that it's alive. Now maybe that's my ESP picking up on its powerpoints as if that makes sense as I am, as you know, sensitive to energy, Deb. The ley lines converge here and at certain times of year, odd natural things occur. Looking across from the house where our parents and I used to stay, there's a field out the back of the house and it has a really big garden. I'd help mum do the gardening and as a veg help keep us fed. Often at times when I was digging, I became aware that I was being watched. This, for the most part, happened just to start with. I wasn't quick enough back then to catch them out, but I learned the trick of using my peripheral vision to find them without moving my head. You slowly rotate your sight to where they are. Now I see them plainly. I see folks in robes. The light brown, grey brown, almost always outside in the garden or in the field out back. If I lost concentration, they'd be gone. And as I grew older, I got used to it. Plus other things would happen as I grew up and in my adult years. There was a small black cat that used to sit on the gutter outside the window at the house. And it meowed to me, but I was the only one that could see it. Later, as an adult, I saw Mum's cat sitting on the bench outside her new house. Mum came into the kitchen. I said, the cat's looking well. He's outside on the bench. Mum gave me a funny look and then said, the cat died in the winter. I glanced back at the bench and that cat had gone. I like to think he came through the veil to say goodbye to me, Deb. Cats are like that. The night when I saw the lightning strike the rock over and over again, I believe I witnessed a change of the craft's crew. I am completely convinced that there's something under that field. The sand on top of it blows around the shape. You can see it for yourself. The rocks out there are no different to all of the other rocks off the coast of the UK. Perhaps in days before modern humans arrived, we would use places like that it almost looks like an entrance to a tower or a tunnel leading into the hillside. And as strange as it seems, someone's block covered the sea on Google Earth. It's been airbrushed out. I've seen some strange things out there. One time I saw something I can't describe in the water. I was around age 10 at the time and I was fishing below the Coast Guard lookout. It was a bad day's fishing anyway. And I got this really uneasy feeling. And when you live close to the sea, you're well advised to heed that. So I moved off quickly, thinking bad weather was coming in. I started to climb the hill towards the house, and when I was halfway up, I heard a black-headed gull call out. It gave a frightening sound. I looked back, and just where I was fishing, the bird was on the water. It was pecking at something. And then I saw, like, a kipper-coloured fish moving behind this bird. And something grabbed the bird's body on either side and then over the top. And then the bird and it swam off backwards. I told my mate Stag what I saw and he laughed saying it must have just been a kipper. And then that same day he and everyone else went out and took all the creels in. They didn't put them out for a good three weeks. All that summer I kept an eye on the rafts of seabirds. And sure enough, birds on the outer edges of the rocks were being taken and eaten in the same way. I had a special place where I'd watch from that looks out across the bay. The krill runs always good fishing for birds, but it wasn't krill. 
I mentioned it to the nature warden. He said it might have been a seal, as they eat seabirds sometimes, saying I was confused as I saw it at the end of the day, you know, not much light shining through the water. I know what a seal looks like, and that thing took the bird was not a seal, and it was new to me. They say diabetics make good mediums. This is how I know now, because I was walking across the middle of the links one day when my blood sugar dropped. It floored me. I was majorly disorientated. Keith went on, I was in trouble. Then I saw someone walking towards me. I called out to them, but they came straight to me anyway. A grey figure they looked like at first, then it took the form of someone I knew. It looked like a local man that I knew very well. There was no sound from him. He smiled and he pointed at a large patch of heather berries. I grabbed a handful of the berries and just ate them quickly. As I came back to my senses, my blood sugar level went up and he'd gone. He shouldn't have been there anyway, as the good old soul had passed away about 18 years prior to that moment. I had changed my routine that day, as it was the first light morning of the year, so instead of going a long way round on the road, I decided to cut across the moor. It was a quicker route, and I'd get to lie in for a bit longer. Before walking the two miles to get to the bus to work, I had to pass the gamekeeper's cottage. So I'm walking briskly on the path and I headed for the gate. I came through, out the gate, onto the road next to the croft. I stepped out onto the road when everything went a magenta colour, including my vision. And again, I was suddenly hit with pain. I collapsed, landing on my back, looking straight upwards. And there above me was an almond-shaped craft. It was making a humming sound, similar to the encounter when I was 16. It shot straight up and I passed out. On waking, I was now lying on the grass verge part of the fence, and that's a good distance from where I should have been. I wasn't lying on the road. I was propping myself up, looking at my watch. As I was, at the time, about 15 minutes away from catching my bus, which should have been around 6am. It was quarter to nine. I called in sick that day. I had a really bad dose of flu one time and I was staying with friends. I was majorly exhausted and I couldn't move. I was phasing between hot and cold and I'd reached a stage where you feel so bad you just concentrate on getting better. Thinking I'd passed the worst of it and just lying there, I was shocked to see a head and shoulders appearing at the end of the bed. The head became a body that climbed up on me and moved slowly up my chest. It was like it was moving on the walkway above me. I could see it and I said, hello, in my friendliest way possible. This being had dark eyes, a pale complexion. It seemed to be wearing what looked like a light green boiler suit with a box thing in his or her bag. I couldn't tell any gender. I just chatted to it throughout the experience. And when it had finished whatever it was doing, it gave me a jobs well done tap and headed back down my body to the end of the bed. Just before it disappeared, I said goodbye to it and waved. It was just vanishing from sight, and then its head popped up, and it gave me a really funny look. It was hard to tell what that look meant. I think it was thinking, oh, he still falter. And then I went on to try and go to the bathroom, so I know I was awake. I wasn't dreaming. At home last night was a dark night. Something was trying to scare me. It might be because I've been talking about all this. I was riding a big black horse with an army of what can only be called the damned behind me. I was heading between two mountains and there was a village in front of us. I heard a voice speaking to the villagers, telling them to get up to the top of the mountain. It was saying, I can't keep you safe from them. If they walk through your village, that's it. They did this and sent word to everyone to get high up into the mountain safe. The sky was as black as night, no stars on the horizon, and everything was a ruby red glow all around me. And then suddenly, I'm standing at the bottom of the hill, and someone I knew was there, and she said to me, it must be June, Keith. And then I felt something was interfering with the feed, for lack of a better word. My alarm went off. Any of your folks around you, Deb, know anything about dream interpretations? 
I saw a huge black hound on the estate years ago. It was really big and bulky. I tried to entice it with treats and the like, but it wouldn't have it. I asked around if it belonged to anyone and no one had seen it or knew where it was from. It's not the first large hound I've come across. They're often in my dreams. Growing up, I'd see a large white wolf running beside me, predating like in the Game of Thrones. I saw a grizzly bear once in the dream. I asked if he was a totem. He just sniffed me, grunted and walked off. I was sitting at my window one morning when I saw something falling out of the sky. As he got lower, it was a grey disc. I thought, crap, it's going to land on the village. Luckily, it flew over and then landed over the horizon. I watched the vanishing spot. It skipped as it hit that water. And for a short time, I saw a glowing orange, perfectly round disc rise above the horizon and then fall back down. It was an awesome sight. In my old house, it was about 11 miles from sea level to the horizon. It kind of all tied together, I think. I think there's a landing site offshore. A question if there's a crew change, maybe, or a lightning cargo port, I don't know. There is a quarry with a really big cave behind it, and it's dangerous from all the earlier blasting, so it's out of bounds. No one ever goes into it. The wraith that I saw was on the path to that quarry. I now believe that was a catch and release, similar to what we do with animals. But we forget, to some beings, we are the animals. One more odd event happened when I was walking home from my friend's house and I stopped at the bottom of the hill. I was a young boy then, just before my teens, and I was coming from the direction of the cliff where I'd meet that wraith in five years' time. I stopped because I heard what sounded like a baby crying. I was about to go and have a look when my friend's dad called at me and he said, stop, and he came down to where I was. We both listened to the sound. It was like a baby crying. My friend's dad said, no son, that's not a baby. His face was grim looking and staring at the sound. And then he said, it's a rabbit caught by a fox. He said it while still looking at the sound. He said, go home now. And if you hear that again, don't go near it. It's dangerous. He went back to his house and then waited at the door and watched me until I was safely in my house. I stuck my head out and I looked back. And I saw his dad go back into that house. I think they took the form of someone I knew and trusted that day to make me calm. He definitely wasn't a fox or a rabbit. Or maybe by the look on his grim face he knew what it was. Or he'd heard tales of what it might have been. There are many tales from the surrounding area. The worst one for me being the sea wolves. That hunt the shores and cliffs hunting to eat and devour unwary folk especially when the wind's howling and the sea's running high. The sound I heard that night has been heard all over the world. It's used as a law. Bigfoot makes that sound. Dogmen make that sound. It's to draw you in. As you said many times, Deb, why me? Why you? When you share on some sites, they say, well, you weren't taken, so they must want us alive for some reason. And they say we're the lucky ones. But they keep tabs on us. Why they keep tabs on us beats me. The older vi villagers knew. They were aware of them. They talked about them. There aren't many of them left now. And I live somewhere else. They're still watching. I've seen the small ones. The big ones come in like the other night and just watch. They move amongst us. And occasionally, now less often, I see the robe figures. Usually following other folk around. Thankfully, they can't see them. Why us, Deborah? Why us? I think this is a good place to leave things for this week. I think we have a lot to ponder. I would like to thank Keith for allowing me to share his experience with you all and for our many chats backwards and forwards. So for now, I bid you farewell and I will be back at the same time, same day next week with more cases from the BBR investigation files. Good night, everyone.